If you're seeking freedom in a revolution, oh, if you're seeking freedom, you won't find it there. For once the guns stop blazing, you'll find it amazing how the world can drag on just as before. And if you're seeking freedom in a marble mansion, oh, if you're seeking freedom, you won't find it there. For even when it's sunny, you'll be counting money, keeping up that showcase, your face lined with care. But if you're seeking freedom on a throne of power, oh, if you're seeking freedom, you won't find it there. For though men all obey you, what if they betray you? Tense you'll be and waiting for foes everywhere. But if you're seeking freedom, cast away desires, why barter like a beggar, you've wealth everywhere. For never can you buy it, grasp and you deny it, freedom can't be hoarded, it's free as the air. And if you're seeking freedom, Seek it on the mountains, got sunlight on your shoulders, the wind in your hair. For there's no one can hold you, boss about or mold you. Once your heart is free, you'll be king everywhere. For there's no one can hold you, boss about or mold you. Once your heart is free, you'll be king everywhere. Thank you, dear. We'll just leave it. All right. <clears throat> There's no program unless you ask a question. So, who would like to ask the first question? I am, as most of you know, because you probably were there with Swami Kriyananda, I have been a devoted student of Swami Kriyananda since I was 22 years old, which is more than 40 years ago now. I was at the beginning of the first ashram community that Swami Kriyananda started in California, which is now known as Ananda Village. This is a new style of ashram in that it is for householders, monastics, single people. We, we have our own schools for children. We have our businesses. It's just trying to make an integrated spiritual life that doesn't divide up people. And I, I helped with the founding of that community. And then um, some years later, after I met and married my husband there, he sent us to um, the area of Palo Alto, Silicon Valley, which is just south of San Francisco in California. And for the last 25 years, my husband David and I, who is also Nai Swami David now, um, we have developed an ashram community there, where we have a temple that serves the greater public, we have a school for children, and we have a residential community. We also run a, a bookshop where we sell metaphysical books of all kinds. And again, it's to provide a, an integrated spiritual life. In all these many years, my primary work has been to talk to people about Yogananda's teachings, to teach them Kriya, to initiate them into Kriya, um, and to help people understand how to live a satisfying and fulfilling um, spiritual life. So I've had a wide range of experience and also the opportunity to work very closely with Swami Kriyananda. I actually wrote a book about him. There's two biographies of him now, and I wrote one of them. It's called Swami Kriyananda as we have known him. And it's really a collection of stories of people's life experience with him. I feel like the life of a great soul is how he affects the lives of other people. And so that's how I wrote his life story, is to write about his effect on everyone else. So that's, in brief, what I'm standing in front of you to share. And I'm willing to take any questions that you have. Would anyone like to begin? Yes, Chaya? Mm -hmm. uh, always wanted to ask this question. In life, uh -huh. you go searching for what happened, 
or does it happen to you naturally? <laughs> okay, let's start with the good one. The question is, do we go searching for what happens in life or does it come to us? Um, I think if you go searching for life, what's going to come to you is going to come. <laughs> so I think the truth is, the truth is everything in the universe is interrelated. I'm not one who studies scientific realities, but a friend of mine was talking to me about how you know, in the highest level of physics, they're discovering that if the electron does something way over here, the other electron does something way over here, they're using the phrase non-locality in terms of the way the universe works, which is the opposite word of omnipresence. But they're discovering that you, you cannot separate one reality from another. This is not spiritual people. This is scientists who are working objectively or discovering the strange interconnectedness. Now, everything about Sanatana Dharma and the Vedanta philosophy tells us that we are an interrelated reality here. And yet people have this strange idea, I'm not accusing you of it, but saying that people have this strange idea that they could take something about their own life just out of this interconnected web. And of course it's not possible because even the gesture of trying to pull your life out of the interconnected web is going to affect the whole web, isn't it? A woman um, teacher that I knew said she had difficulty understanding the idea of karma and interconnected realities, but she was holding her grandchild and the grandchild sneezed in her face. The woman got a cold. As a result of that illness, she had to cancel an important engagement. As a result of the important engagement, all of these other things happened. Then she worked backwards from the other side how did I come to be holding my grandchild? Well, before there could be a grandchild, there had to be a son. Before there could be a son, there had to be a husband. Before there could be a husband, the husband had to have parents. And before that I could meet him, then where do you cut it? Where do you say that this caused this? Yogananda is even more challenging in this. He said, because we live under the illusion of time, and one thing follows another, we have the impression that one thing causes another. And he just says after that that there is no time itself is an illusion, and this causality is an illusion, that we are really operating in one simultaneous integrated system. Now, what that really means, could you pull this over here, because I just had a really fun idea for this one. Could you help? Yeah. <clears throat> I've, heard, I've heard that spoken so many times about the illusion of time and the eternal nature of now and all of those things. And finally, I'm going to pull it a little farther. This way. Finally, I came up with a really interesting thought, which I'm going to share with you all now. I heard Swami Kriyananda say since I was 22 years old that time is an illusion, that everything is now, that past, present, and future are the same. I heard him say it probably hundreds of times, and hundreds of times I had no idea what he was saying. Then recently he wrote a book for children called The Time Tunnel, which is out there. It's a very charming book. And all of a sudden I got this picture. This is where most of us live, which is a circumference like this. And we live somewhere. Here's our incarnation right here, let's say. Here's our incarnation right here. And let's say this is one person's reality. So this is where we are now. These are all the lives we've lived in the past. These are all the lives we're going to live in the future. When you're sitting right here, you can't really see very far into the future. And you can't really see very far in the past. And in fact, you might not be able to see anything. Now here is, let's, I'll put a star like the spiritual eye. Here's the center point from which everything emanates. As we move farther away, even a little bit, from deep identification with the particular body and life that we're living right now, even if you move this far into it, suddenly you can see a little farther both directions, can't you? Your perspective begins to shift. And you can, and literally, if you expand your awareness and become less deeply identified with one small thing, you'll begin to understand your own past. Now, I'm not being 
really metaphysical about this, but like some person, for example, who is very inconsiderate of other people all the time and then is outraged when people treat him rudely. I mean, you've met people like this, somebody who's mean all the time and then when you're not nice to him, he considers it, why are you not nice to me? Because he's so identified with himself, he can't see even his own past to that extent or his own future to that extent. We become more self-aware, we gain a bigger perspective, we understand what we have done, we understand the consequences of it. Spiritual life is moving ever closer to the emanating center of everything. And you can see that when your consciousness expands to not only include this, but to include the source of where everything came from, suddenly from this perspective, past, future, and present are all equally accessible to your consciousness. And you can then see that it's happening in all directions. You can see it all at the same time. You can also see it's progressive because again, from here you see, you would have a realm like that. And, and this is the way that we actually begin to understand reality is not by trying to take this little thing, this little bit of our life and force our will this way or force our will this way. All that that does actually is confine our perspective because we're, we're relating to a smaller and smaller reality. I want my own free will. I'm going to do what I want. Whereas when we go this way, we relate to a greater and greater reality. I hope you like this. I love this. <laughs> this has been one of the most. <laughs> this is the gospel according to us. Yeah, isn't it? It just really worked for me. Suddenly, all of a sudden, I see how it all comes together. And I can actually say, oh, yeah, past, present, and future. I don't realize this. Believe me, the difference between a clever diagram and the actual state of realization, I can speak to the difference. I have a clever diagram. But it does. But you see it from the top, yeah. And also this equidistance. You see how your equally past, present, and future is all the same. It's a fascinating thought. This is the fun of Yogananda and Swami Kriyananda, is that you know, it just keeps going in your life. Just allow life, uh, to just allow life to yeah. happen to you. Just let it happen. Just well, give them freedom. Yeah. You have to use tremendous willpower in the way that you relate to what comes to you because one of the manifestations of divinity is power and energy. And we need to become channels of the divine force. So to, to re, um, let me see, to not try to force our life in a certain direction is not the same as being passive about our life. The phrase that we use in our community is we say, what is trying to happen? instead of saying, what do I want to happen? But even we say, what, what is trying to happen? And when we tune in to what's trying to happen, we may then commit a tremendous amount of willpower to facilitating that. But the point is always to look at it from a bigger point of view than just my own desire. So there's the way Yogananda put it, I will reason, I will will, but guide thou my reason and will to the right path in everything. Because he made a strong point of the necessity to participate, but you want to participate from the right level. Is that fair? Yeah, it's a wonderful balance. Yes, yes. It, it, when we raise to the higher level of consciousness, we advance the time? We transcend time? You, well, you recognize the reality of the simultaneous. I'm, I'm beyond myself when I say yes. Yes, they, they say time and space is an illusion, it's a quality only of this world, and when we transcend this world, we transcend it. Not having transcended yet, I'm not sure exactly what that means, but it's marvelous to contemplate. It's a great exercise for meditation. This lady is trying to speak, yes. Can you enlighten us regarding free will and destiny with reference to self-image? Oh, free will and destiny. We're not getting any small time questions tonight, are we? I guess we started with free will and destiny, so there we go. Okay, let me think about this for a minute, because free will and destiny. 
Okay. Ah, Swami Kriyananda has answered this often, and I'll try to remember how he puts it. We tend to think of free will as the freedom to do whatever we want. Okay. But what we don't understand is that what we want is not free as long as we are identified with the ego and therefore compelled by the fears and limitations that define us. Okay? So let me try to say that a little more clearly. I've been talking about this point. So free will is also preordained? No. Where I have to, I mean, indirect thing is also preordained. What traps, what traps us is that we do not know who we are, okay? And I've said this several times today, so excuse me, those of you who've heard it. Yogananda defined uh, limitation, ego. Ego is the limiting force. Ego is the infinite self that has become identified with a limited reality, just like this picture. When we live in ego, we think we are this incarnation, this body, this culture, this age, this gender, this set of relationships. And when you stop and think about those, they are all defined by the body that we're born into. Because you live in a woman's body of a certain age, and the woman sitting next to you perhaps is a relative, you know, all of these relationships all start from that body that you're in. I live in a different body, so I have a different sense of myself. What the masters tell us is our bondage is because we falsely believe that this physical form that we're wearing, or even the astral form that we're wearing, is actually me. Okay, think of it like this. I was saying earlier, I'm wearing this blue dress. I've been wearing it all day. When I go home, I will change out of this blue dress. I'll put on my pajamas. Tomorrow I'll put on something else. It will still be a blue dress, but it won't be this one. Now, if I were to actually believe that I am this dress, and if taking off this dress were a frightening experience that might threaten my well-being, we would all think that I was not mentally normal because everybody knows that I'm not my dress. It's just something I put on over that which I call myself. But what I'm wearing under it is my body. And because we, lived, we live in this body so long and for lots of other factors, no one thinks it, it odd that I call myself my body, except from the master's point of view, to define myself by wearing this body is as ludicrous as defining myself by wearing this dress. But I am not identified with this dress. I don't call it myself, but this I call myself. And I have a whole host of other commitments that are all based on this. Now, a master lives in a body. Yogananda lives in a body. Swami Kriyananda lives in a body. I know because I can speak from his consciousness. But he wears his body as lightly as I wear my dress. And it simply does not define his reality. Right now, most of you probably saw him at the music hall. And you know, he, he takes two people to get him out there. And he has to be sort of dropped in his chair. And when he's ready to get up, he raises his arms. And you know, he's 87 years old almost now. But as soon as the body is not an encumbrance, the spirit is just completely unlimited. His awareness of realities beyond this one of people, of himself, it just doesn't matter what's happening to it because he no longer identifies with it. And therefore, come to the word freedom, he has the freedom to choose his state of consciousness. His state of consciousness is not limited to where his body is in a state of ultimate freedom. Um, he doesn't, he's not even limited by the perception of the senses. A master is omnipresent. He knows the thoughts of everyone everywhere. Now that is freedom. And we think that free will is the free will to be identified with this body and then move it wherever we want it, or to have it do whatever we want. But we're, we're trying to define freedom in a state of total confinement. And then, to come to the question of destiny, all of the identifications 
that brought us to, to be in this particular body, all the karmas, all the uh, uh, samskars, everything that drew your soul into that particular form are forcing your actions. The ones that were there from the day you were born and everything that you've built up since, they're forcing your actions and you're bound to them to the degree to which you identify with them. Swami Kriyananda and any master, when, even when a free soul like Yogananda incarnates, his consciousness is unlimited. But once he takes a body, he is bound by the times in which he chooses to incarnate, by the mission that he has to fulfill, and also by the karma of the disciples he's come to help. But his consciousness is free. But what he's able to do in this world is dictated by the limitations of the material world and the karmas that are all surrounding his mission. So the question that you ask has to be answered by turning the whole question from another angle, which is to ask not, you know, is it destiny, is it free will, but what is free will? What is real freedom? And is destiny, you know, what, what, what means the word destiny? Um, karmas are set in motion. They must act themselves out. Our free will is how we relate to them. Where, to come back to this diagram, do we relate to them from here, which is the center of uh, infinity, or do we relate to them from the edge on which they're happening? The degree to which we relate to them on the edge, we're just totally bound. We have no perspective the degree to which we can move toward the divine center, this, this defines our freedom. But that doesn't mean that the events of our life are still not going to unfold according to the karmic conditions that are already woven into them, but it means our relation to those events is one of freedom of consciousness. Okay? Did, did, did that make sense all the way through? What would you like to ask now? <laughs> so in regarding to see, one thing there, uh, you find that the spirit enters the body out of trouble comes. <laughs> but the spirit enters the body because... Yeah, generally, yeah, because uh, yeah, it has to undergo the circumstances. Most of the uh, circumstances is like that. Yeah. Uh, and it is also uh, in our I mean, ecosystem, the, the soul has got three bodies, physical, astral, yeah. and causal. See, there are ways you now to destroy the physical body, even by self. Yeah. <laughs> like that, no, when we destroy the astral and other things, uh, it will get liberated. There is also another way. Yeah, I understand. Yes, sir. You say that everybody is born with a karma. Yes. Which we inherit from a previous birth. Uh, and all the births before that. It's not as simple as that, right. But the population has been increasing. Yes. So more people are born and people are dying. Yeah. So where are these new people getting their karma from? Yogananda's answer to that is one, there are many, many planets, many, many, many planets, and there are an infinite number of souls. We're just looking at Earth and thinking that we have the whole system. Um, Kriyananda has a book, he, I believe it's out there, it's called Conversations with Yogananda. He asked his Guruji, he said, Master, do we always incarnate on Earth? And Yogananda said, oh no, there's many, many planets to go to. If you kept coming back to the same planet, you would figure it out too fast. And that, there was no further explanation to that. It was just a grim prophecy that he offered. I mean, to begin with, you know, this planet is moving out of Kali Yuga into Dwapara Yuga. Swami Kriyananda mentioned that, and I've talked about that some. The phenomenon of the Yugas on a planet is an astronomical fact. It has to do with the orbit of our Earth in three, Teshwar says, in relationship to its dual. With the, the scientists haven't found the dual. But the dual planet to Earth makes an elliptical orbit like this. And according to Sri Yukteswar, that whole cycle takes 24,000 years. Now, there is the grand central source of this whole galaxy that we're in, and that's an emanating source of energy. This is his explanation of the yugas. So as we move closer to that source, the consciousness of this planet becomes higher because we're receiving more energy. And then as we move away from it, 
the cycle begins to go down. And this is 12,000 years ascending, 12,000 years descending. This is all um, according to the way Yogananda, Sri Yukteswar, explains it like this. But, so this means that you know, you, you're, on, you're going to have to find a planet that is going through the right yuga cycle for your karma because you can't just grab a hold of earth and hold on until it gets higher, to be a higher age, if your vibration is not suitable for that. So in a very higher age, some of the demonic souls that are being born on earth right now, they simply won't, they'll have to go to a, a grosser planet. And so the, this cycle is happening all over the place. It's a, it, we just, our minds are too small. That's what Yogananda was saying there. Our minds are much too small. He says, you can, that just, anyway, he says there's a lot of choices, a lot more than we know. Durga? How will we get a, get a back of us to become pure? Oh, I'm sorry, just say it one more. How will we clear a back of us? A bad karma. To become pure. A little at a time. <laughs> Um, everybody wants a shortcut. <laughs> I, I mean, there was one woman who I gave many satsangs, and every satsang she would ask a question. She would always phrase it in a different way, but it was always the same question. The question was, could you tell me the shortcut? Could you tell me how to make it easier? Could you tell me some like secret that you're holding back from me that now you're finally, when I ask you for the 50th time, going to tell me? There's no shortcut. And your bad karmas are really not nearly as much of a problem as you think they are. Because Sri Yukteswar is famous for saying, everything in future gets better as soon as you start moving in the right direction. And one's concern, even about bad and good karmas, there's no such thing as bad or good karma. We define good, as I was saying earlier today, as ple pleasant and easy. That's what we think of as good. We define bad as difficult and unpleasant. But there's no good or bad karma. There's only progress from bondage to freedom. And if you have to go through something really difficult in order to become free, is that really bad karma? You see, we only think of it as bad because we've defined things according to the pleasure of the ego. But if we define things according to where we're going and what it takes to get there, I've read many mountaineering books. I like stories of of brave people. I've finally grown tired of them. But I've read many accounts of climbing Mount Everest and climbing Annapurna and you know all of those different things. And those people are completely nuts. I don't know why they do that. But they go through so much suffering, intense suffering. And it's all deliberate. It's all free will. They decide to do it for the sake of achieving that goal. And then it's so thrilling when they finally achieve it. Well, talk about bad karma to be 22,000 feet up on you know, the mountain. But they do it on purpose because it gives them a power. So when God sends us terrible challenges, why would that be bad karma? Because what he's saying is, well, you're going to get to climb a really high mountain. You're going to discover strength in yourself you didn't know you had. You're going to develop a power that's going to give you the ability to face anything. And then we call that bad karma. But it's not bad karma at all. It's God helping us to grow. So the way to get over bad karma is just jettison that thought from your mind and just say, whatever God sends me is good because everything that comes to me is for my highest good. And even that very thought just begins to shift the whole reality. You, you can't get to freedom except from here. And, and you're going to just have to walk through whatever is in between. But don't worry about what you're walking through. Don't worry about where you're standing here. Just view it from here and realize that it's all a journey into the light. You know, people, things are, Yogananda said, circumstances are always neutral. Whether we experience them as happy or sad depends on the predisposition of the mind. It's a very interesting thing to think about. It's always neutral. Happy or sad depends on, on what, how you feel about it. So if people close to you have to face difficult circumstances, why is that bad? Is it better that they should be just left to vegetate and never grow in their life? 
that everything should be comfortable and easy, why would that be good? Because the ego likes it when it's easy and pleasurable. But from any bigger perspective, there's nothing good about that. Does that make sense? Yeah, just to add one to what she's asking. See, the character of Kunti in Mahabharata, she wants more problems. She's praying for more problems. She says, Krishna, please give me more problems. Oh. Then only I'll be riveted to you. Yeah. Otherwise, I'm getting scattered. So I want more problems so that I get focused on. Well, that's a very good point. Sometimes the more difficulty, the more we pray, the more... I met a woman, I'll tell this one story and then I'll, I'll go to the next question. A woman came to our retreat when I was living up at Ananda village. I, read, I was at one of the instructors at the retreat there. This woman came to California all the way from Sweden and she had become, um, a, no, she had read autobiography of a yogi and she came where she could find us. She told this story to me. She had had a, a sister who was very close to her in age. They were like twins. They did everything together. They loved each other completely. They planned their whole lives together that they would always be together. At a very young age, that sister developed cancer and despite the best efforts of the doctor, she died. The woman who was left behind, the one to whom I was speaking, absolutely devastated. Just every plan that she had for her life had just been taken away from her and she could hardly bear it. Because of that intense suffering, she had to pray because nothing else was saving her. She said she prayed with an intensity she did not know was possible and she received a divine response that she never would have imagined was there, which eventually led her to autobiography of a yogi, to Kriya Yoga, to meditation. Everything in her life turned in a positive direction from the tragedy. So I said to her, it was a risk on my part, was your sister's death a tragedy? Conditions are always neutral. It depends on how we respond to them whether they lead us upward toward the spirit or downward. Even death itself, it's the end of everyone's life. The karmas of the life runs out and we go into the astral world. We don't go anywhere, we don't die. We just take off the body. But if we're so attached either to our own body or to someone else's, it becomes a terrible tragedy to us, but that's because we have no perspective. So the way is to forget the word bad. <laughs> What is the difference between self-realization and self-motivation or self-involvement, self-inducement? And uh, when do we reach the path of self-realization? When you reach the path of self-realization, you're always on it. Everybody's on it. Everybody is going toward greater and greater awareness. Some are just going consciously and more deliberately. But all of us are being drawn. Earlier today, every river is being drawn to the ocean. Self-realization, of course, these are just English words. There's no, these, are, these are words to which we give meaning. But self with a capital S means to realize that divinity is our own nature. And the difference between realization and empowerment or enhancement or improvement is all of those words are pushing to make something happen. The word realization itself is if, you know, if somebody were standing behind me this whole time and I didn't know they were there and I suddenly turned and realized they were there, my turning around would not have created a reality that wasn't already there. I merely expanded my awareness to include it. And so that's the unique nature and it was a very good choice on the part of Paramahansaji to call it self-realization. We realize who the self really is. And it's, I mean, there are other words for it, but it's a unique um, understanding that is not encompassed by merely making ourselves better. It's completely redefining who we are, changing our identification from the periphery to the center. We can strengthen the periphery, we can make the periphery more, you know, effective, but it's entirely different to change your sense of identity from the periphery to the center. This gentleman had a question first. Okay, Just a minute. <laughs> uh, so the yeah. problem is the, the problem is the, uh -huh. the problem is 
the existence is to identify certain universal values and then apply it in our day to day life. And then we can uh, bring out an order in the world, social order, economic order, right. order. The problem is uh, the humanity is yet to find out uh, values. Basically, it did not come from the heaven. It is only learned by the experience, by the people right. who are living. Right. So we lived so far uh, lakhs or uh, maybe 1,000, 10,000 years old, yeah, the humanity. But uh, there is a problem still uh, it has to evolve uh, yeah, universal, uh, collectively. We could belong to various uh, countries you, and all. Um, there is problem to well, I'm going to have uh, one word, one word, one government. Okay, I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to answer this from a different level. Okay. I'm not here to speak to you about creating an ideal society, an ideal world to solve any of the problems of the world. That is an entirely different discussion, in which I am not interested, nor am I qualified to talk about. Many, many people are interested in the collective development, in the change of the society, all of those things. I am interested in self-realization. I am qualified to speak about self-realization. I have certain beliefs about how the individual quest for self-realization will affect the rest, but I can't even pretend because I don't really think, you see, let me say it in a different way. This world is not meant to work. This world is not meant at this particular stage. We are early Dwapara Yuga, just coming out of Kali Yuga. The Yuga theory, the Yuga explanation of the consciousness of a planet is quite fundamental to a discussion, which is to say a, a planet in this transition from Kali Yuga to Dwapara Yuga will have a certain quality of consciousness and no amount of affirmation on the part of every ego on the planet is really going to make it any better because it's trapped in that cosmic reality. We have incarnated here because this is the right setting for us. But we have not incarnated here to make of this world something other than it's intended to be, which is a, a place where individuals who, for whom this is the right setting get to work out their karma and get to face the un karma is unlearned lessons. And the one lesson we're trying to learn is that we are one with the infinite bliss. And the lesson that we don't know is that we think that we're this body and we have to suffer. So we get to come to a planet in which a whole lot of things are wrong because all of that is the grist, you know, the, the, the rough stone against which our rough edges are rubbed. Now, how we respond to that is critical for our personal development. And, 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 how, and our personal development is critical to the extent to which we're able to help others as well. But we'll never make a, a perfect planet because Dwapara Yuga beginning is just going to look like this, where there's a lot of technological advance, a lot of potential, and a whole lot of greed and hatred and anger and, and really bad folks sharing this planet with us. Why we chose to come now and not just hang out in the astral world until it turned into a higher age is a really good question. <laughs> but apparently, at some point, we thought this was a good idea. So I can't engage in a conversation about making this world work because I don't have any belief that we can do that or that we are even born to do that. But don't misunderstand me. That doesn't lead to a lack of compassionate concern. It's just I think the way we get there is by individuals re refining and expanding and awakening their consciousness, finding true bliss, and helping others. All of you were in that room with Swami Kriyananda, or most of you were in that room. You know, this is one man. There were 1,700 people in the room. This is one man who had to be helped to his seat. And one man told me who was up, you know, practically uh, on the ceiling up there. And he said he felt like Swami was right in front of him. And he just felt this 
um, well, bliss is the word, this bliss coming into him that changed everything. I mean, that's real transformation. And of course, enough of that would or could change the whole planet eventually when the planet frankly gives a damn, which it doesn't right now. I joke about it, you know, Swami's created a whole universe of writing and potential and someday when the age on this planet rises a little bit, people will care. And then they will find that it's already there. Very often um, the, the contribution of a spiritual person is not in their own lifetime. I mean, look at this book. I mean, how many of your lives have been touched by this book or how many lives have been touched by this book? Yeah, it was just, it was just dropped onto the planet. This is where real change comes to place. Even if you look at history, change always comes from spirit. Did you have a question? Okay. Yes. When does a person make his attention and attention for part of self When does a person attend? Awareness is a degree of compulsion. It depends upon the situation you are placed in. Right. So when exactly? Uh, when does it come? I don't know. I haven't got there yet, so I'm not exactly certain. Nor do I seriously, and I have to say this, really think about it. We were having a conversation about this the other day. Freedom comes, I'll speak from my own life, but it's also a truth. The less I worry about myself on any level, the happier I have become. The less I am thinking about this little ego and what it gets and what it doesn't get, even what it gets and doesn't get spiritually, just causes my thoughts to spin around myself. And I do not find that either happiness producing, um, God attunement producing, or beneficial in any way. So I just figure, I get up in the morning, I do my practices, I try to be as conscious as I can all through the day to do the highest, to respond to every situation the best I can. And believe me, I have better and worse days like everyone else. And when I finish that day and I do my evening practices, I go to sleep and I start over. And I figure everything else is going to take care of itself. Because really, what else could I do? And you know, I'll find out what I need to know. And in the meantime, I'm doing the best I can. So I don't have an interest personally. Swami Kriyananda said about himself, and I really understand it. He said, he said about himself, I have a simple mind, Swamiji said. I mean, he has a brilliant mind. But he has a simple mind. He's right. He likes simple, useful facts. And even if it gets very sophisticated, it's a simple, useful fact. Abstractions, for me, they don't help me when I get up in the morning. And I just find it's just easier just to leave them aside. You can probably find other people who are fascinated by them and can talk about them, but I'm not the one. Yes, sir. Uh, Ajahn, you, since uh, it is up to the souls to, um, to uh, raise their consciousness uh -huh. and uh, ultimately merge with the, uh, with the divine, would it be correct to say that uh, the souls have created themselves out of sheer ignorance and desire <laughs> than saying that the creator has created? Well, because we didn't create ourselves, because there is no us to have created ourselves. <laughs> um, when everything comes back to the center, there's only one reality. Yeah. So we're manifested from Satchitananda. We are nothing but Satchitananda. Um, what you're asking is that question, which is how did we get here and why are we, yes. why are we stuck here? Whether, uh, no, it is, uh, everyone says that uh, uh -huh. Yeah. Universe. But would it be in the light of what we have discussed so far, would it be better uh, or more appropriate to say that matter has created itself out of uh, sheer desire to be something? Well, to be away, to be, uh, but that's, that's, giving, that's giving too much power to the small ego. And it doesn't, in, that thought does not in the end lead to freedom. Yeah. What really leads to freedom because I mean, we haven't, it just hasn't come up in our conversations in these two days very much, but it's central and I, I see now what an omission this has been. The, the, the devotion to God, it's one of Patanjali's you know, admonitions to be de devotion to the Supreme Lord. Love and surrender and faith 
and relationship to a higher power is, is an enormously magnetic and transforming reality. So to think of ourselves, and ideally we think of ourselves, one of the things that Yogananda brought in spiritual teaching, which was more strange for the West than for the East, but he talked about God a great deal as the Divine Mother. Now, of course, the Divine Mother is much more, much more in the Indian culture. In the West, Christian-oriented, it's been the Heavenly Father, so the Divine Mother was a big change. But it's not like, you know, there's some mother up there with a little apron sort of making chapatis and feeding us all to us, standing in front of the heavenly stove in the heavenly home, you know, and the Heavenly Father comes back from the heavenly office. I mean, it's just too <laughs> ludicrous, you know? And even Lakshmi and Parvati and so on, even though there's, there's tremendous symbolism and meaning there, it's not really about the form. But what the Divine Mother is, is that there is a feminine reality. And so when we speak of Divine Mother, we're talking about the cosmic force as feminine. What does feminine mean? It means nurturing, it means comforting, it means compassionate, it means all forgiving. And when we can begin to make our spiritual life not merely this sort of dry personal effort, but we're actually in relationship to an attractive force, then our spiritual life begins to flow in a much sweeter manner. So even great souls like Yogananda or like Swami Kriyananda, they still talk of God as the Divine Mother, and they still think of themselves as, as Mother's little boy. Because that sweetness actually puts you more in tune. And when I was talking in the meditation class, I was saying, the thing about meditation, and this goes back to the question of self-realization, is we're not this is not imagination. We're not making up some beautiful world that we wish were there and that we're kind of walking in this dream world. We are like a radio receiving station and we're trying to attune our consciousness to receive vibrations that are there. So the Divine Mother doesn't exist with her apron in front of her stove, but infinite compassion and unconditional love is the truth of this universe. So our little minds have a hard time grasping the abstraction, but we know mother. You know, we've all had a mother. If we've been fortunate, we've had a wonderful mother. If we haven't been fortunate, we know what a wonderful mother might be like. So we, we can connect with that image. And when we connect with that image, it puts us in tune with that force. And that's so much sweeter and actually so much more efficient than just me trying to make my self-realization. So the rightness or wrongness of your thought is less important than it's not a helpful thought. Far better is to make a relationship with whatever form of God attracts you. Because I know that you're more involved than some are, the prayer that Yogananda offered was, Heavenly Father, Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved. These are the classical bobs. This is how you relate to God, is some people like the father feeling, some like the mother feeling, some want to be friend to friend, some want the romantic relationship. The one he doesn't mention is when God is your own child, which is, of course, the Gopala and all of that, um, and also uh, master to disciple. And the more you cultivate that as a real thing, the more you'll find your energy being effortly magnetized. So be a child of your Divine Mother. Let her have made you, because that just makes you all hers all the more. It's a more useful thought than the other one. Really to connect with the higher consciousness is also periodic. That's my still thing. If you have the previous karma or also with it, you are ordained to go in that line. Maybe all of us have come here because we have had some Definitely. common interest in coming and learning more about it. Yeah. Well, it's preordained. It, it's preordained in the sense that we have ex we we learn by experience, and we, it takes many lifetimes to have enough experience. One of the factors that Yogananda emphasizes in his spiritual path is you must 
work to have experiences. You must learn from your experience. This is not dogma. This is not a priest making a promise. This is not a church making a promise. This is your experience of where your happiness comes from. So preordained is another way of saying, I have had sufficient experience that I now understand this, that I'm not going to just devote my life to keeping my body beautiful and having lots of money and being famous in the world, because I know from my own experience that that is a dead end. So it's preordained because I've learned this much already. And no, you're right. You don't seek God until you have begun to suspect that what you're looking for will be found in that direction. And so you can't tell someone who is still absolutely convinced that they will be completely happy if they just have these certain material achievements that no, in fact, you should search, uh, seek God. They'll just look at you like you're crazy. But you can call it preordained, but what it really is is they haven't had enough experience to know that's true. We never learn anything because somebody tells us. I had the most ridiculous experience this way. For 25 years of car travel with my husband, he has always said to me, <clears throat> you know, when I have a little, <clears throat> excuse me, a little satchel or something like that, I would always put it on the hood of the car. Don't put it on the hood of the car, he said, it will scratch the car. He told me this over and over again, so when he was around, I wouldn't, thank you, I wouldn't put the satchel on the hood of the car. So then I borrowed his car. He keeps things very pristine. He has tremendous power over the material plane to keep everything really nice. So I borrowed his car. I threw the satchel onto the top of the car, and then I pulled it off. It was just this canvas satchel, but it had those little metal feet. And it scratched a big W, right, in the hood of his car. And I stood there and I said, wow, look at that. If you put the satchel on the hood of the car, it'll scratch the car. He must have told me that a hundred times. And obviously, I never believed him until I actually scratched the W into the hood of his car, just like that. And it was so apparent to me that it doesn't matter what people say until you actually experience. It's totally trivial, just to finish the story. Fortunately, I was visiting friends in another Ananda community. And the man, uh, the, the husband of my friend, is my husband's friend. So I said, look what I did to the car. Call him and told, tell him I did this. Because husband to husband, it'll be a joke. <laughs> <laughs> so he very nicely did. By the time I got home, my husband was laughing. And also, also good, my friend made it seem like I'd ruined the whole hood of the car. And so when he just saw this little W in there, it was so small, it was perfect. <laughs> but it really told me that you can't really tell somebody anything. I mean, I'm a bright woman, and I trust him, but I didn't believe him because I hadn't experienced it. So you say to someone, oh, that's not really going to give you satisfaction. Don't waste your breath. When they say to you, I'm beginning to feel that maybe my values are not going to give me happiness, then you can say, well, that's worth considering. But it's pointless. And you can't argue with yourself. This woman said to me, this woman I, I love dearly, who desperately pines for a husband and can't seem to attract one, she says, how can I understand that human love is just a distraction? I said, never. You're never going to understand that. You know, you want to be married. Don't even try to persuade yourself that human love is a distraction. It's just not even sincere. You know, you can say to Divine Mother, this is a rotten deal and I really don't like it, but you don't believe that. We have to really work from where we are. You, you, you need to affirm a reality greater than the one you have, but there has to be some connecting link between where you are and what you're affirming. If you affirm beyond yourself, you actually do yourself harm. Because every time you affirm that, the rest of you says, oh, come on, you're kidding. I'll never be that. So you just affirm a little bigger. This is partly why also I don't worry about whether or not it'll be self-realized or when. You know, it just makes me nervous. <laughs> I'll just try to be nice today and happy today. That's within my realm. That's what I can reach. Yes. In all the books that you've been reading, is it long? It's 22 years back when I read the book. So from that time, I was uh, wanting to join this day. I was like, you know, how to yeah. find the path. Uh, he has written that some souls depart 
dinosaurs, they wait for the industrial world of almost thousand years right. again reincarnate. Mm -hmm. Is it uh, written, destined by God or by the uh, free will of the soul to wait for the thousand years and come again as incarnation? <clears throat> you have astral karma, you have material world karma, you have causal world karma, and it all plays itself out according to the way it's going to play. Um, it would be the right vibration for you to stay in the astral world if you chose to stay for a thousand years. It would be because whatever it was that your soul needed in order to progress, the river is always being drawn to the sea. Um, you can also, though, we can decide that we're not going to progress. We can just sit down for a while and hold on like this. I don't understand why you would stay in the astral world for a long or short time, but it would be in harmony with the unfoldment of your soul. You see, from here we think a thousand years, that seems so big. Compared to eternity, nothing, it makes no difference at all. It just seems long to us. Oh, what have just said? It just, it just seems long to us, none of it. This is all the illusion of time. It's all happening at the same time. We think it's a big deal, but it isn't a big deal when we finally come to this point. So the masters tell us, and by no means am I standing there, but you know, standing here, things look a lot different than, than I did standing here. So I can feel what that would be like. You know, we're in the astral world as long as the astral karma lasts, and then we become restless with material desires. And we just get sucked away. You know, it's like you plan to spend the evening meditating, and then you're hungry, and you go out to the pizza hut instead, and then you meet a friend, and the friend takes you to the movies, and then you finally come home, and you remember, when did I decide that I wasn't going to stay home and meditate? Because one desire leads to another. So as I understand it, we're in the astral world, and everything's just fine, and then some little material desire just kind of sucks us away, and suddenly we're in a little baby's body, saying, how did I get here? But the, the karmas come to the surface and unlearned lessons. Something that I think I have to have in order to be happy. And gradually we go through all those experiences one after another and realize that this is not it. This is not really going to give me what I want. And we eliminate that from the options and gradually we start centering in on what really will make us happy. And then we become devotees, we become sadhakas. We begin to do things that will actually cultivate true happiness. And once we're, once we're here, we're actually really quite far on the progress. I mean, look at the planet. How many people are really looking for God? You know, early Dwapara Yuga, the planet we've chosen, not many. So we're very fortunate to be already thinking like this. So a few thousand years here and there, you know, not long. By comparison, <laughs> yes. Morning, you were saying regarding the financial. Uh -huh. You were discussing. Uh -huh. You said on the third point that you have to watch where the happiness is coming from. Yes. So I was of the view uh -huh. that happiness is always with you, and your very being is itself is a happiness. Uh -huh. So how do you look for where the happiness is coming from? Well, let's put it the other way. What is interrupting your experience of happiness, which would in fact be a more true way to say it? What is preventing me from knowing the bliss of my own nature? And what's preventing us is our attachment and our involvement in all kinds of other things. So we ask whether this action is actually you know, bringing me closer to my own nature of bliss or moving me farther away from it. So it's the same way of saying, where does my happiness come from? The actual answer to that is it comes from within. But you see, that was the question I was asking. Where does my happiness come from? It comes from within. That's the answer to it. Then why am I weeping because I lost this job? Why am I weeping because I can't have children? Why am I weeping because I don't have the money I want? Where does my happiness really come from? And we're always, just as I was saying this morning, we're always acting according to what we really feel to be true, not merely what we can say clever, but what we really feel to be true. And that's why I'm, you know, I'm very humble about this, because I'm very clever with words. I can say all kinds of things. But who I really am is what makes me weep. 
I have to say, if, if I can become frightened over this or angry over that or distressed over this, and I'm not Swami Kriyananda. I'm a much better person than I was when I started. But, but every time any condition of this world disturbs my inner peace, then I am answering the question wrong. You know, where does my happiness come from? If they bring in the integrity in the individual, between the intellect, body, and mind, right. there is disharmony. If we bring out harmony, that is integration, integrity. Well, yoga, the word. And then uh, there is scope for happiness and peace. Absolutely. The that word. The word yoga means union, and it means union in every aspect. The highest union is the individual soul with the infinite spirit. But on the way, everything else begins to come into harmony also. That's definitely true. And the more unified we are in all dimensions of ourself, that's the wonderful thing. And I mean, I have to keep coming back to the life I've lived. Paramahansa Yogananda advocated intentional spiritual communities as the, the social pattern of the future, where people live together an integrated life. He called it home, job, and church in one place, where all, all um, styles of life were allowed, where you didn't have to just be a monk or a nun and live in a monastery or a convent, but you could come with your family and raise your children um, so that, because we are in Dwapara Yuga rising, that spirituality could be integrated to every aspect of life. My particular training has been to be one of the founding members of the first such community that was, has been started on this planet by Swami Kriyananda way back in 1969. And therefore, my whole spiritual training has been in this totally integrated life. You know, how do we deal with love relationships? How do we deal with conceiving and raising children? How do we educate them? How do we grow vegetables? How do we build a temple? How do we run a meditation retreat? How do we make money? You know, how do I be psychologically healthy? That's what the 140 books he's written are about. How do I be a good leader? How do I be a good friend? So that there's been no aspect of spiritual life that hasn't been utterly integrated because the ashram itself has been a complete way of life. And so whereas usually you think of an ashram as we pull away from the world and we live this very um, rarefied life, our ashram has been exactly the opposite. And, and therefore, we've had to learn on a very practical level how to do all of these different things. And that is the social pattern and the spiritual message for the new age a completely different one than, than this divided against yourself, which has really been the common way of thinking until this time. It's a unique contribution of Swami Kriyananda and of Ananda. That's why every time you come to a program here, Devendra puts on the wall here the Pune community and what we're trying to build here in India. This is the first, but God willing, not the last by any means, of an attempt to create in this country exactly that model, which is we need to think in a completely different way. And by the grace of God, we've done it very successfully, so we know how this is done now. You know, we were shooting in the dark. Swami Kriyananda knew, but he, he had a pretty ragmuffin crew behind him is the only thing I can say, and he had to drag us through an awful lot. But he, we made it by the, by the grace of God. <laughs> And so now there's a lot to say in that respect. It's a whole new way of thinking. And, and it, it is Kriya Yoga, because that's what it was Yogananda's mission manifested by his disciple and now in our hands to carry forward again. Do you have plans to start in Chennai? Chennai? Sure. Like Pune? Sure. But it's not my plans, it's your plans. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's no such thing as somebody doing this for you. This has to be the desire of the devotees here to do it. In, in Palo Alto, where my husband and I started another community, we started it because the people were there and they wanted it. I mean, they didn't quite understand what they wanted, but we could see that if we helped them manifest it, it would satisfy them. We could see the aspiration. It's been very, very successful in that respect. But what, what good would it be for David and me to do it? It had to be the the natural expression of the consciousness of the people there. Because the community is not a thing. 
It's a collective uh, understanding of the need for self-realization and the commitment both to the mission and to one another. And you, that's not something you impose. That's something that is awakened, and it's people's destiny. Say again. Happiness comes from within us. Well, what, why is the reluctance on our part or the lack of effort on our part to achieve it? Is it lack of realization of what we are doing? No, we're not quite convinced. That's the actual reason. The moment you become convinced that your happiness lies in self-realization, to that extent exactly you put out effort for it. So it is internally realized. Everybody. Everybody, everybody in the world does exactly what they want to do. I mean, even if you think you're compelled by everyone around you. A woman wrote to me, her, her family, I presume she was from India, was, came over the internet, so I don't know where she was from. Her, she was, her parent, she was being, how did, how did I put it? She was being pushed into a marriage of a man she didn't think was her soulmate. And she says, I have to marry him. I said, no, you don't have to marry him. You're telling me it would be very inconvenient for you not to marry him. It would upset the comfortable life you have. It would make your parents upset. But I said, are you an adult person? Do you have a passport? Do you have, you know, can you walk out of the house? Of course you can. You're not, you're saying that of the two choices, which is to upset your comfortable life or to marry this man, you think you're being forced to marry him, but you're not being forced to marry him. You're choosing. We always choose. Some of those choices are extremely difficult, but we're always choosing because this one looks too hard, this one looks easier. This one looks too painful, this one looks less painful. And it's completely in our hands how much we meditate, how much we love God, how much we give to the spiritual path. We give exactly as much as we think will make us happy. And I'm sorry. There are a lot of cows there in the cow shed. I don't know who is looking after them. Is it abandoned the cows or who the members? Uh, asked a vendor. Asked a vendor afterwards. I want the gentleman next to you to ask a question because he hasn't asked. Yeah, the spiritual reason for that. Yeah. Okay. What were you going to say? I would like to understand the significance. This concept called faith because you read in newspaper. Second. I'm sorry. Speak just a little slower. I couldn't quite follow it. Uh -huh. I Say would like to understand the significance of this concept called faith. Faith. Because when you read a newspaper, the second page you see an 18 year old boy in bed with an iron and dies. Uh -huh. And a 70 year old man wins a lottery. <laughs> and people just attribute it because of their faith. Uh -huh. I just want to know whether this faith is the end result of the karma accumulated by them in their past, right. birth, or janma, whatever it is. Well, faith is really just another word for the result of your own experience. Really? That's what they, uh, that word is used very commonly. Uh, it, it, the word is so used. Any action they say is your faith. Well, just because people say something, it doesn't mean it's wise. <laughs> <laughs> so I can't defend a remote statement but that I didn't make. You can listen to anybody. <laughs> okay, let's. Some faith is like that, it is faith. If it comes to them, that is faith. Say again. That's when you record saying that it's faith. Well, sometimes it's a lazy man's answer. Well, it is. It is due to. Okay, this is the question. This is why this morning, when I finally had an Indian audience in my hands, I tried to talk so hard about karma because I'm so tired of hearing this. I was trying to give us a whole nother understanding. Whether I succeeded or not, I gave it my little all this morning. Now you're t you're asking me the same question again. So what can I say? <laughs> I think I'll go shoot myself is what's going to happen. <laughs> okay, having gotten that off my chest, let's go on with this. I was working so hard against that today. <laughs> you have as much faith as you have. True faith is based on your experience. You know, if a hundred times God has rescued you, when the hundred and first threat comes, you have reason to believe that you'll be rescued this time. If it's just faith that's based on a hope, if it's faith that's based on, the, on fear, that I want to have faith in God because otherwise life is too terrifying for me, but you're, the real center of your vritti is just terror, that's not faith. 
that's just fear and just trying to put your head under a shell. And this is why Paramahansa Yogananda incarnated. He wanted to give us a way to build our experience. Kriya Yoga is that way of building experience. You discover through serious meditation practice that I am not this body. I am connected to this infinite source. And that source is, is Satchitananda. That source is bliss. You get just this much of it. And you have faith when things happen that how could it be that bad if this is my underlying reality? And that's real faith, no matter what people say. But people use faith all the time, honestly. I mean, the Catholics use it. Everybody uses it. They don't have any good answers for the question, so they just say have faith. No, no, no. You know. Faith. 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 Oh, F-A-T-E. Faith. Well, but, but this is the same question I've asked before. I've answered already. Yes, of course everything is interwoven. There's no way that you can pull any individual reality out of the whole web of creation. So in a certain sense, of course, everything is going to go according to how it goes. But once you've decided that, you realize that my freedom is freedom of consciousness, not freedom of circumstance. And then when you'd be in to develop freedom of consciousness, circumstances look different to you. Even this bad and good karma, you see, all of a sudden it becomes just your perspective. So you don't really think so much about fate because fate isn't the issue anymore. The issue is my consciousness. And how much do you work to change your consciousness? Depends how much you've experienced. And is all of that predestined? Well, in a sense it is. But Here's another thing. Where does this conversation take us? You know? It's like I get up in the morning. <laughs> I'm back to getting up in the morning. You know, I like useful answers. Because otherwise you just spin these theories and at the end of it you're not anywhere anyway. How free do you feel? Not very. So how can I feel more free? By changing my consciousness. So it becomes practical at that point. And then the other answer is, do more Kriyas, because the reason we can't understand how the world works and why is because our consciousness is too contracted. Expand your consciousness and you'll understand more how the world works and why. But you're not going to be able to just sit there with a contracted consciousness and demand an answer. So the answer to everything is to expand your consciousness. And then the question is answered by, by direct perception. So, and so I answered a question about faith too, which you didn't ask. <laughs> I've done pretty well understanding, understanding Indian English, but I do fail every once in a while. Can I ask something? Sure, and then we're... Asked if there are shortcuts. Oh, that's where we started, wasn't right. it? Uh -huh. So, it seems that Kriya is the answer. Kriya is a shortcut. Kriya is a way to break out of this... Um... Well, Kriya, Kriya Yogananda described as the airplane route to God. So, but it's not a shortcut, it's just a faster route. I mean, what, yes, you're right. If there is a shortcut, it is Kriya. But, but when people ask me that question, they're asking me something else as a rule. <laughs> so, yes, sir. Uh, are there people who have seen their previous lives and what do they have to say about it? People who have moved higher up the scale. What do they have to say about them? Yeah. In what, in give me, give me more of a context. That there's a lot of them? You say there are a lot of people who have moved up and yeah. able to look at their past. Uh -huh. so what do they say about their past? Have you seen, met any people who can tell about their past? Their past birth, their past life? Well, I've, heard, I've had lots of people th think they can see their past lives and tell me about them. Um, Were they born on this planet or some other planet? Oh, people tell you all kinds of things. My goodness, you hear all kinds of stories. How many of them are true? How many of them are actual realization? Mm. Mm. Some people, you know, and not everybody talks about these experiences. For myself, I've had two, I've had one dream and one intuition that I believe are specific past lives. Otherwise, what I have is the sense of what my past incarnations must have been, which I have deduced from the present reality. But I'm capable of deducing it because my perspective has expanded enough that I can see what the influences are in my life. 
and therefore, because my belief in reincarnation is solid, I understand that those influences are the expression of past lives. And in that sense, that's the only useful part of it, is to understand, for example, in, in two of the, the two specific true intuitions that I had, explain to me antipathies that I was experiencing with people in the present life, that I was able to recognize were not actually happening in the present at all, but were just a memory of antagonism in the past. And in that sense, we're very liberating, which is why I think both of those were given to me. So that's an answer. I spoke the other day about becoming very nervous about being separated from my husband in the airport, and somebody else told me it was because I was abandoned as a child in some other incarnation. I don't know whether that's true or not, but it really put the pieces together for me. So when we behave in ways that don't make sense, sometimes the idea, at least, of it being a, an unresolved issue from the past, um, I find is more sensible than any other way of thinking about it. So I became persuaded of reincarnation. It just worked, whereas nothing else worked. It just put pieces together that otherwise didn't fit. We have reached the end of our appointed hour. I have a great loyalty to time. so. Um, unless somebody else simply can't go home without asking a question. I guess somebody can't go home without asking a question. Ashok, okay. I feel great energy here, uh -huh. as I felt last time. Is uh -huh. it coming from you? Is it coming from somebody else? Oh no, here's where it's coming from. There's no secret about where it's coming from. Yeah, no, that it's, it's all from here, the I promise. Vibrations are. The vibrations are here, I know. I experience them also. No, it's not the hall, it's the masters. A hundred percent. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay, I, I forget sometimes that people don't know. This is a line of gurus. Every, uh, uh, every individual pictured here is an avatar, which is to say a self-realized master who incarnated. The, according to, these are, this is Yogananda. Yogananda says that Krishna in a later incarnation became Babaji. So that this is, he, he always prays to Babaji Krishna as the same soul. Babaji is well known as the immortal Himalayan yogi who lives even now. You know, I was at the temple at Bhadranath, they worship the image of him. He's well known all, everywhere. Yogananda asserts from his own experience that Babaji is an ever living master. But Krishna is also here because Krishna and Babaji were the same mission. This is a continuation of it. This is a, a painting, a rendition of Jesus Christ. It's not here merely because Yogananda worked in the West, but Yogananda also tells us that there's an alliance between Krishna and Babaji, um, and between Jesus and Babaji, that Jesus had responsibility for the spirituality of the West, Babaji for the East, and now in rising Dwapara, it's time for these two lines, two realities to come together. Look around, the world is becoming one and there is a specially strong alliance between India and America, isn't there? So this was the beginning of this lineage, was, was Jesus and Babaji beginning to send a new messenger. So Babaji's disciple is this soul and his, we call him Lahiri Mahashaya, Lahiri the Great Soul. Lahiri is his family name. He, he, he lived in Varanasi until the late 1800s. He incarnated as a free soul, but he took the life of a householder because he was the beginning of this lineage of a new way of thinking about spirituality. So instead of incarnating as a Himalayan yogi, he incarnated as a, a government accountant. He lived in the city of Varanasi. He raised two sons, he had a wife, he had a home, and, he, and in his early 30s, he was drawn to the Himalayas, and he met his guru, again, Babaji, who initiated him into Kriya, and then sent him back to Varanasi to teach the Kriya technique. And then Lahiri Mahashaya sat for the rest of his life in the living room of his house, and over the course of time, thousands of people came, and he initiated them into Kriya, and it began to disseminate. See, during Kali Yuga, all of this has to be draw withdrawn. It can't be commonly known. But now that it's Dwapara, he could be a householder and initiate Kriya. One of those people who came 
is this man, Sri Yukteswar. And Sri Yukteswar lived until 1936. And he lived, he had two ashrams, one in Puri and one in Serampore outside of Calcutta. He had very few disciples. Early in his life, he was also married and had a daughter, but his wife died and his daughter became married and then he became a renunciate. And his chief and virtually only disciple was Yogananda. And then Yogananda was trained as the end result of this whole lineage to take this teaching to the West. And so in 1920, when Yogananda was in his early 20s himself, he was born in 1893 in Calcutta. No, he wasn't born in Calcutta, but he was a Bengali. He lived in Calcutta. And uh, he trained with Sri Yukteswar, and then Sri Yukteswar sent him to America, where he lived almost all his life. He died in 1952, um, before he was 60 years old, and he only came back to India for one year when he sensed that his guru was going to die. And he came to be here for his guru's passing, and then he went back to America. He had an American disciple, many American disciples, but the most notable among them for the purposes of this discussion is this man whom most of you met, who he was 22 years old in New York City, and he read Autobiography of a Yogi. But it was 1948, and so Yogananda was still living. So he, as a young man, just left everything behind, got on a bus, crossed the United States, came to Los Angeles, found Yogananda, walked into the room and said, I want to be your disciple. First words he spoke. Yogananda initiated him on the spot, accepted him as a disciple, took him in as a monk. And for the last four years of Yogananda's life, Kriyananda lived with him. And Kriyananda's entire life was based on those only four years. By the time he was 25, his guru was gone. But so deeply had the guru's vibration been planted in him that everything that you see is the result of that. And then those of us, a few of us in this room, you know, were drawn to him. And here we all are. And isn't it fantastic? And now you're all sitting here. And who knows what the end of the story will be. Can I supplement something to the audience here? Uh, just, just a moment, if you don't mind, sir. Is there, is, is that, does that satisfy? And here you are. And then here I am, and I'm happy to be here. It's possible to give unconditional love. So much talked about. That's so good. If you have no self-interest and therefore no ego, then you are a pure channel for the divine love, which is unconditional. So the answer to that is yes. And can you move? To, did, you under, did you hear what I said? Shall I say it again? If you have no... Accent and this. Yeah, I understand. And yours to me. So let's both try. Um, if you have no self-interest, if your only interest is the welfare of the other, and if you have the wisdom to know what that welfare is, Yes, it's perfectly possible to give unconditional love, but we move toward that by the same process that we describe everything else. And certainly, these masters have no ego and nothing blocks that perfect expression. <laughs>